Hi, and welcome to our webinar, COVID Proofing Your Business, hosted by Cole March and PCO Bookkeepers. I'm Marisa Palmieri, and I'm your moderator. I have 15 years of experience as an editor of magazines for small business owners, so I can imagine some of the questions you might have right now and some of the pain you might be feeling. That's why I'm excited to kick off this relevant session designed to help you navigate the new realities of doing business amid the COVID-19 crisis. We hope it will address some of your concerns. First, let me introduce our presenters. Donnie Shelton and Dan Gordon. Sorry, I'm having trouble advancing the slides here. Donnie is the owner of Triangle Pest Control and CEO of Cole March, which is the leading provider of digital marketing and sales efficiency solutions for the home service industries. Cole March has been helping pest control and lawn care leaders get more leads, close more sales, and grow their businesses for over 10 years. Dan Gordon is CPA and Managing Director of PCO Bookkeepers, an accounting and bookkeeping firm that has been offering financial management services to the pest control industry for over 20 years. They work with hundreds of the most successful and largest pest control businesses in the United States. Both Donnie and Dan have been flooded with calls and questions from clients about how pest management companies should proceed during the COVID-19 pandemic, and they have some great advice to share with us. In today's session, we're gonna cover how to respond to the pandemic through the five major areas of your business, leadership, marketing, sales, people management, and finance. And then we'll have about 10 to 15 minutes for questions at the end. You're welcome to type your questions into the chat box throughout the presentation, and we'll address them in a future session. Donnie and Dan have committed to hosting this as a recurring weekly meeting to provide updates until we get through the crisis. These sessions are being recorded, so they're accessible at the link on your screen if you happen to miss the live events. Also, any resources mentioned during the webinar will be available for download. Finally, I'd like to remind everyone that the information presented here is not legal advice. Please consult, consult your attorney with any questions. So let's get started. First, we're gonna talk about leadership. Companies have already had to make some really tough decisions and there are likely many more to come. So Donnie, how is Triangle Pest Control responding currently? And what have you heard from Colmar's clients as far as how they're responding? Yeah, well, I just wanna reiterate, this is definitely not legal advice, so I'm gonna do the best I can. Um, also another disclaimer, uh, there's more to come in later webinars. Obviously you see that we've got a lot to cover. We got five different topics. We could probably spend an entire hour on each one of them. Uh, so today we're just going to try to get to the critical information and some action items that you can take away right now. Um, and then in later webinars, we'll dive into specifics depending on demand and what people are really struggling with. And so having said all of that, um, I think, you know, just to start this off, one month ago, if someone would have came to me and said, hey, Donnie, listen, there's this big pandemic coming. Uh, the economy is going to tank. Unemployment is going to quadruple the previous record. You're going to be locked down most of the united states are going to be locked down i probably would have laughed at you yet here we are in this new reality where it's almost like i, I just it, you know i wake up and it's surreal i haven't been to the office in you know three weeks and i just i can't believe what has happened um and the other thing is is that this is our new reality right i mean it seems like every day something is changing there's something new well, i think the stimulus bill is supposed to get signed today um but you know despite what happens, despite, you know, what comes in terms of what we anticipated or not, you know, it doesn't really matter what happens, you know, now what matters is how do you respond to what has happened. Um, I know for us at Triangle, as well as at Cold March, our office is completely shut down. You know, everyone's working from home. Our service techs, they are, um, they're not coming to our office. They're almost exclusively doing outside services. I'll talk more about that in a little bit. And, you know, the main thing is, is that you know, the idea here is that, you know, you have to embrace and adapt to what's happening. I mean, for us, I know both at Colmarch and at Triangle, you know, it's it's seeing challenges as they come up every day and then solving them almost every single day. It's a different type of leadership, I think. And, you know, a lot of times I'm very, very big picture. Everything kind of moves slow. In this environment, everything's going super fast and we're just having to stay on top of it as much as we can. I think the second thing, you know, is manage the emotion. You know, Lots and lots of people are very scared by this. It seems like, you know, we are bombarded with negativity. You probably have technicians that are driving around, listening to the radio, 
And over and over again, all they're hearing is about how people are sick, people are dying, the economy's tanking. Um, you know, everyone is super scared. I know for me personally, when this first all happened, I certainly felt fear. But, you know, I think as leaders, one of the things that we got to do is we have to stop, you know, be a source of positivity, be a source of calm and go back to the numbers and truly, you know, truly try to understand what's happening and cut through that emotion. Uh, not to say that you don't have empathy for your folks and making sure that you're showing empathy um, to your team, but but ultimately you have to be the guiding voice. You have to be the voice, voice of calm and hopefully, not. I don't want to say spinning, but you know, being the, the positive voice at your company. And then lastly, not lastly, I guess third to last here is communication. You know, I am communicating probably 10 times more than I typically do. I'm talking to my leadership team, it seems like hourly, uh, certainly speaking to the company, the entire company from me weekly. Um, and they should be hearing from you, right? I mean, your team should be hearing that you've got a plan. They should feel like you you know, you, you know where you're going and that you got your hand on what's happening and that someone is really looking. And then the final thing, which is what most people don't want to talk about is disaster planning and tripwires. You know, the, the reality of it is, is that we don't know how long this is gonna last and the key question that you need to know and understand as a leader is um, how long can you last? And you know that's a tough question. I know a lot of people don't like to talk about that, but I would say you know disaster plan now, and, and and really you need to answer the hard questions of what are you willing to do, and what do you have the resources to do? And that would be a complete overview of your bank lines. Like you know how long can you go? What are you willing to accept before you make a change? Uh, and you know the reality of it is is that it's really about the process, not necessarily the result. And the only thing I can go back to there is, you know, Mike Tyson says it best, right? He's like, everyone's got to plan it until they get punched in the mouth. It's just, just keep in mind, you know, disaster planning and tripwires, it's about the process of understanding what you're going to do, not necessarily exactly, you know, your plan going is exactly as planned. I mean, this, I think this pandemic is a perfect example of that. So. Mm -hmm. Okay, great. Thanks, Donnie. Dan, can you have anything you've seen or heard other pest control companies doing? Sure. So pest control is pretty resilient, and uh, I'll talk about that later in the finance uh, area. Um, we're going to fare much better than other industries. We just will. Uh, we we did in 2008. Uh, we're a needed service. Uh, our technicians have been uh, designated in most states as essential. Um, uh, you know, uh, Homeland, uh, 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 the Department of Homeland uh, Security, uh, they also designated us uh, that way. And so we're not hearing a ton of stuff going on. Our our clients are very concerned, but few are seeing big declines yet, unless they're handling a lot of restaurants and bars and things. Um, they're not making rash decisions, um, but most are looking into the options available by the government uh, in terms of what's available. But as far as leadership go, this is the Super Bowl of leadership right now, and it's time to win. It's time to step up and see what happens. This is your Super Bowl. Okay, great, thanks. Um, moving on to marketing. Donnie, tell us what you see happening in digital in terms of trends for our industry and consumer behavior. Absolutely. Well, I wanna start with the basics. Obviously, there's a lot of things happening on Google. If you don't know this, uh, you will know it pretty soon. There's been some significant changes since this is all kicked off that Google has done. Some have been somewhat surprising. The very first change that I wanna talk about is reviews. You may have noticed that Google is now temporarily limiting reviews and Q&A on your Google My Business listing. That doesn't mean that you will not get your reviews if someone leaves them. Doesn't mean that you can't respond to them. All that means is that they're taking that information, but nothing's getting published. Um, so any kind of existing uh, reviews that you have, any kind of existing replies, any kind of Q&A, it will be visible. And we assume that all of that will be published once Google has the resources to um, to publish those those reviews and those responses. The, um, the next slide <coughs> is that uh, it talks about Google local services. So Google local services, if you can believe this, um, <laughs> we asked about this and what and the response that we got is that we got word that the Google lower, Google local services support team is not in the office at this time, which I think is kind of funny because all of our businesses are in the office. We were just going out remote, but apparently they're not. So um, when you're setting up dashboards right now, what Google is doing is they're prioritizing critical health related businesses. So you can expect a delay, not necessarily that it won't go up, but there will be a delay now anytime you're trying to set up anything Google local services related, unless it's health related, because that is taking priority. 
Um, the third big change that's happened is with Google ads. If you have tried to do an ad that has COVID-19, coronavirus, whatever, even if it looks like it's approved, Google is suppressing any and all ads that contains those terms. And so um, that replies to, you know, whether it be keywords, ad copy, any kind of creative. So I'd be very, very careful um, because of this change, right? I mean, reviews are, are down for the most part. Local services is really, really slow. And any Google ad that has COVID-19 and coronavirus is automatically going to get suppressed. And so those are kind of the big slide, I'm, I'm, the, big slides, the big changes that are happening with Google. Now, having said all of that, the key question that I would be asking is, is what, you know, what does this cause in terms of consumer behavior? Like, is it going to change? And if consumer behavior does change, how's that going to affect my business? So I'm a numbers guy. Um, I have been watching this extremely closely. My team's been watching it a lot closer than I have. And, and so really where we got to start is we got to start with the numbers. And this first slide that you're looking at here in terms of marketing is general volume. Um, it's, it's pest control. That's for that term uh, in March. And you can kind of see, you know, pest control overall for 2020 versus 2019. And again, this is the search term pest control is actually up 18% uh, for all of March compared to last year. So that's extremely strong growth. Um, not, you know, if, if I were kind of outside looking in, and I saw this graph, I would have no clue that there's some pandemic going on and that folks are locked down to their homes. Um, you know, so far, it, it, it seems like, at least on the digital side, we have been relatively unaffected by the change. Now, I'm gonna, I am going to put a couple of disclaimers in here. You know, when you start limiting this data set down to seven and 14 days, you know, for the last seven days, it's actually, this has been down. And for the last 14, it's been relatively flat. Overall, for the month, it's up 18 percent. Um, but, you know, depending on which state you're in, you know, some states are up, some states are down um, in the past 10 days. It's, you know, the main thing that we're seeing right now, especially in the last seven days, is that the year over year organic traffic for a lot of our clients is actually starting to drop just a little bit. And that's been, you know, as of the 15th of March. And so PPC demand has been on, on point, um, of course, and that has remained fairly consistent. So overall, you know, I'm not seeing anything catastrophic here in terms of on the digital side. You know, when you look at the data, it's pretty strong so far. Um, you know, just kind of stepping back for a moment and trying to understand what this is really telling you is, is that, hey, March is really, really strong so far. We might be losing some steam, you know, something that we need to keep an eye on, especially for uh, April. And, you know, there's nothing dramatic here. I think it's great news for us. We just need to keep a watch on it and see if the trend continues. The next question is, is you know, is consumer behavior um in a state that's locked down what does that look like so i went through and looked at you know california new york and illinois and it's actually pretty surprising so california is still up 11 percent year over year for pest control searches in march again these are for states that are locked down in new york it's up 12 percent year over year and in illinois illinois it's up 18 percent for pest control um you know the last two new york and illinois they actually have been slightly down for the last 10 days but by and large it's kind of crazy right so folks that are locked down um, their traffic for this term and this is just one you know snippet of data I mean we could go you know into multiple areas of data but for right now I'm just looking at this exclusively what this is saying is that you know for lockdown states traffic is actually up for our for our industry which I think is a wonderful thing the next thing to look at as far as consumer behavior is what about consumer behavior in states where there's high unemployment rates if you go to, um, yeah, there we go, you got the slide up. So, you know, Pennsylvania had had the biggest number of claims uh, this past week. They were coming in at 378,000. California went from 129 to 186,000. New York, it went from 66 to 88. Uh, Illinois, Ohio, Florida, all of these have had jumps in um, unemployment claims. And if you take a look at that, search volume was up year over year in all of those states. Um, again, if you look at the last 10 days, it kind of fluctuates depending on which state you're in. But overall, I don't think there's much of a trend here. It doesn't seem to be that if you're a state that's locked down or if you're a state that has, has high unemployment, that it does a whole lot for our industry. Uh, there's really no evidence to support that our industry is being affected by either of those numbers yet. And I, I want to qualify that yet as of right now. Um, the other thing to think about as we kind of go through these numbers is that weather is also a factor. It's always one of the biggest factors when you look at search. Um, 
And right now we're only looking at search from a demand driven perspective, right? So if I were doing door to door, which you know you can't do in a lot of states, um, we would probably be telling a different story. But for right now, this is all demand driven. So the next question is, is you know, why are we mostly unaffected in these states with high unemployment? If you take a look at this graph right here, this shows you the level of education, aka the demographic, as opposed to um, the unemployment rate. And you can kind of see, I'm not going to bounce over this, but if you look at the very bottom there, the highest unemployment rate is what you would expect, right? Most folks who are taking or losing their jobs right now are mostly low paying jobs. Um, I'm not going to say that's a good thing. What I will say is that it is unaffecting our demographic right now. For people who typically buy pest control, for people who typically buy lawn care, this demographic is usually not who we are selling to. And I think as a result, what we're seeing is, is that we're, we're, for the most part, we're pretty resilient as an industry and we're not getting, uh, we're not feeling the effects too much right now. Now, there may be some areas of the country where this doesn't apply, um, but when you look at the country as a whole, this tells, you know, this right here tells the full story. So on the next slide, um, if you see, the question that comes is, how is this translating to kind of boots on the ground and how is it translating to our Comarch clients? And it's actually, it's crazy when you think about it. Right now, our conversions site-wide, uh, you know, our Google ad conversions are up 23% in March. It's very surprising data. Again, this is taking all emotion out and just strictly looking at the data. Um, the other thing is, is that, you know, I just want to make sure everyone understands where this data is coming from. These are cold March clients. You know, we have about 150 marketing clients. Uh, it's a subset of, of all pest control companies. It's not the entire industry because there's really no clear way of getting uh, all conversion data for all pest control clients in the United States. I'm just telling you what's happening uh, for conversions for, for us. Let's go to the next slide. So I took a snapshot of sales um, just for TPC and Envirocon. And this is just for one small service line that each company has. And you can see these numbers are pretty much on par. Overall sales, I mean, without, you know, without comparison, it's hard to say. I will tell you for TPC, our sales are up and our numbers are right in the slot. Our cost per lead is at $48, cost per sales at $159. And Avirocon is a customer we have out in Houston. He has very similar numbers. It's slightly higher. That's, that's a more competitive market. He's down in Houston. But what this paints a picture of is kind of business as usual, right? I put this on here not to, you know, we're going to compare CPL and CPS. It's more of just showing that when you look at marketing in general, everything for the most part is just cooking along like you would expect it to be. And then on the next slide, we've got where I pulled all of our coal March clients combined. And again, nothing really looks out of the ordinary. Our, our average cost per lead is at $63. Our average cost per sales at 88 and our average um, Google ads cost per lead is at $90. And so, you know, all of this, let's go to the next slide. So all of this now, you know, you can see our pay-per-click spend. Again, it's up eight and a half percent and it's, you know, up 11% over the last seven days. And so all of this is saying is that, you know, for the most part, you know, things are fairly normal on the marketing side, surprisingly. You know, this, what has happened with people being locked down, the states being locked down with unemployment claims, we just are not feeling it on the marketing side yet. Now, I'm not ready to go do a victory lap over this, but what I will say is that, you know, early on right now, um, this is a pretty good picture for us, so. Okay, great. So with all that taken into account, what are your top one or two marketing recommendations for companies right now? Okay, well, I would say my very first recommendation, and this is probably the biggest one from marketing, is make your decisions based on numbers and not on emotion, right? We're not seeing much of a change online. We're actually seeing quite the opposite. More people are active, more people are buying. And again, I think as an industry, we're very fortunate that people are still very much into buying pest and law. My sure. second recommendation is that, you know, there's an opportunity here, right? When you think about what is your highest call volume day, for the vast majority of folks, I'm gonna guess that it's Monday. In fact, I know it is, right? And right now, the reason that is, is because people are in their homes over the weekend, they're doing activities, they see stuff. Well, now people are in their home all the time. And so my second recommendation is that branding. I would be branding like crazy right now because people are online, they're online way more than they would typically be when they were going to work. You know, there's no more driving, there's no more taking the kids around, you know, everyone's on lockdown. So the online time that we see, the average online time, I mean, it's just through the roof. And so I would be all over branding right now I would also be looking at my pay-per-click campaigns um, and I would definitely be looking at 
you know, just making sure that online I'm doing everything that I can to capitalize on the additional traffic because there's no doubt about it. There's tons and tons more uh, traffic uh, that's happening. Go on, can you go back one slide there, Marissa? So this right here is just a sample piece I put up. We've got tons more. Uh, Comars has a ton more. But, you know, it's I would modify my message right now for branding to really connect with what people are going through. Don't get cute and don't try to um, offend people because obviously there's a lot of folks who are scared and freaked out by the pandemic, but people are staying in, right? So leverage that, leverage that in your branding, leverage that in your communication with your customers. And then one thing that I've seen, can we go to the next slide is on social, you know, right now there's this huge, huge popularity. By the way, if Trent's on this call, that's probably not the best picture of him. So I'm sorry <laughs> Trent, just saying that right now. <laughs> Hi, Trent. <laughs> this is a customer out of um, Northwest Arkansas. He's a great, has a great company uh, called Natural State. But you know, they are really leveraging this momentum that people have to want to use local business, to want to support local business at this time. Now, of course, we're not as affected as most industries, but you know, just when you think about your branding strategy, you think about how do I leverage people being home, I would go to social, I would be talking about, I would be uh, exposing that I am local, that I'm here. You know, and people resonate with that. They really want to connect with the local business owner. So right now I'd be investing a lot of time and money in going big and social as well. So, um, okay. and then the next slide, um, I would say, you know, I just would be taking my pay-per-click budget to my max cost per lead and my max cost per sale. Because the reality of it is, is that, you know, I think there's a lot of opportunity out there right now. I don't think a whole lot has changed. And I would let my numbers do the driving, not my emotion. So. Okay, great. Well, what about um, companies who are heavily involved in door-to-door -door sales? Any recommendations for them? Uh, yes, yes. So door-to-door -door folks. Okay, so let's talk about door-to-door. -door. I don't believe that door-to-door -door is dead, um, but the question becomes is how do you do it when you have lockdowns? You've got you know uh, customers who are completely freaked out by getting you know within 10 feet of someone else. And then you add on top of that this whole idea that they're soliciting for um, a sale, right? Um, I have a customer right now in Florida who has completely punted his door-to-door -door sales for the year. It is a very, very challenging time right now for these uh, companies, and I totally get it. If I were a door-to-door -door company and I were sitting uh, in the driver's seat, the big things that I would be doing right now is I'd be branding big time, especially in the areas that I'm going to knock. I don't believe that we're going to be in this throughout the whole entire summer. I don't think the season is completely done. I think we are gonna take a big hit on the front side of the season. Um, I think right now I would be focusing my efforts big time on digital. I'd be focusing my efforts big time on branding. I'd be making sure that any areas that I'm planning on knocking in that I'm going as heavy as I possibly can because you should have the cash to do it, right? Because you're not, you're not paying for door-to-door -door folks right now. Uh, I'd also be going big on pay-per-click and moving as many resources as I could to digital right now just to make sure that I could cover, at least cover some of the loss, because there is going to be a big loss from the front part of the year uh, where you're not knocking doors. And, you know, my last thing would be is just to adjust expectations, right? I mean, my guess is, well, I'm not going to make a guess. I don't think we're going to go anywhere in April. I would be very surprised if we do in May. It could possibly end up being June and July before you can really get on the door. And so I think my recommendation overall would be get into branding, get into pay-per-click, and make sure that you're really pounding those areas that you're planning on knocking for right now. Okay, great. Dan, do you have anything to add about marketing? Yeah, I mean, I think uh, it's all about knowing your numbers. Uh, it's uh, it's not 50% works and 50% doesn't, like the old uh, adage. It's knowing your cost per lead, knowing what your cost per sale is, uh, as Donnie had it. Uh, you know, we have a lot of clients who throw money at marketing and aren't as scientific about the numbers. It's really important at this point that you understand your numbers, right? So the other thing that I would do is I would trend it against last year. We may be down. But does the trend line look like it did last year? So, uh, you know, does your cost per lead uh, move around, you know, from March to April to May? How is the, all of that happening? OK, so so you've got to keep a, 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 an eye on that, understanding that the numbers are going to be different than last year. But if the trends are the same, then we're in good shape. 
But if that trend line breaks and you see that you're paying way too much for uh, a lead, um, you know, the old Kenny Rogers, know when to hold it and know when to fold it. And, uh, uh, you know, if you've got to fold it, then then make sure that, that, that uh, that's what you need to do. Because right now, cash is king. Um, and anytime you're going through a, uh, a catastrophe like this, cash is king. That doesn't mean that you can't be spending it. Uh, just to, to Donnie's point, a lot of our door, uh, a lot of our um, uh, landscape companies are having tremendous success. This is kind of interesting. They're doing direct mail and they're doing pay per click. And what we're being told is that because people are home, you know, they're on the internet, they're looking around for a lawn care company, and several of our lawn care companies are actually up over last year. So um, uh, yes. for now, we seem to be in a pretty good spot. Okay, great. So, so I was gonna go say, by the way, Ben, you know that Kenny Rogers passed away. God bless his soul this yes, week. Yes, I guess I did. I did. I, I wrote this slide before that. So. <laughs> <laughs> All right. <laughs> All right. So hand in hand with marketing or sales, Donnie. In terms of sales, what's um, your current approach, and how are you seeing other companies respond? So you know, for us at Triangle, it really is not much of a change. Um, I would say, if if I were to adjust the strategy, if you're not already doing this, my biggest recommendation would be is go almost exclusive to an inbound model, where you're using digital to drive uh, leads to your call center and then really focus in on your call center. So, on the next slide, um, you know, at least for Triangle, we have almost exclusively been digital since we started the company. Um, and so for us, we're just staying the course and managing our cost per sale. And you can kind of see this graph here. This is what you would typically expect to expect to see in terms of total sales and cost per sale. Um, you know, in the winter time when it's cold, I mean, sales are expensive. And then as it starts warming up, that cost per sale comes down and total sales goes up. And so for us, you know, on the digital side, I mean, everything is kind of normal, normal. On the next slide, um, you know, with our inbound, um, with our call center, we're not letting up at all. In fact, um, we're beating last year, and I'm going to talk more about the call center here in a moment, but, you know, our entire call, our entire call center right now is working from home. We, our office is not open, and we're actually beating last year, and our inbound sales are pacing 20% over last year. And so I think what this is showing is, is that right now, you know, we just need to meet people where they're at and where they're at is that they're home, you know, and if you look at our conversion, you know, you know, our conversion has actually went up 4% since we put people at home, which has been shocking to me because I've always been old school, like, hey, we're all coming to the office, we're all going to, you know, work from the call center. Um, but, you know, the feedback we've been getting from our folks who normally work in the call center is that they're more comfortable at home, uh, there's actually less distractions. Um, and you know what? It's having a positive effect on our conversion rate. And so I think right now, if I were to say, you know, what would be my current approach? It would be get serious. If you have a call center, get serious about managing it and making sure that you have the tools in place um, to to run a distributed call center. Um, so okay. tell us more about that. How has it been with your call center completely at home and um, what's the setup like? Well, I will say, luckily for us, we were already uh, set up for a model like this. I mean, our, our company was using CTM. We had Sprout Cell where we had call scripts already set up, ready to go. Um, we were already using Google Apps. Um, and so, but we had never tested our systems um, in a distributed environment. We had never allowed people to work from home. Of course, this kind of forced us on us. And so what we have actually been doing is we've been utilizing our resources that we already had in place a lot better. Now, that doesn't help you if you don't have this, but what I would say is, is that um, if you don't have this, I would start working towards getting yourself a really good call center. Uh, you can use CTM, you could use um, you know, any other product that doesn't have to be CTM, um, but that's the one that we use um, and we've been very pleased with it. The other thing that you can do is develop feedback forms, right? So that you know when people are working from home, checklists on how they're doing, um, you know, Essentially, all you're doing is just making a written form of running your call center from home. And so all the things that you're seeing here, these these daily task lists, these checklists that we're running, um, they're going to be available on the downloads page. You can totally use it. Um, but in general, on the next slide, right, you can see nothing stops, right? We still are running our, uh, our call center. It, this is great. You know, contests are still happening. This right here is an example of we're using Slack to communicate. Um, you know, managers are still managing. Contests are still happening. Let's go to the next slide. 
And, and, you know, and coaching is still happening. We're still doing training. Anytime we have like a, uh, a script change or whatever, all we do is we get it, you know, we get everyone on the call and we do, we do a quick, uh, you know, meeting in the morning, everyone understands what it is. And so, you know, on the next slide, the last thing that we got is, you know, you do need to make sure that when you go from home, I put an example here of even though people are at home, you still need to run a schedule of who's going to be logged in and when. And, you know, most phone systems, you can see when folks are logged in and when they're not. Um, you know, just getting very, very clear on that, just because people are at home, it's not like work from home when you want. It's like, okay, especially for a call center, you got to be pretty rigid with your times. But I think in general, you know, it's digital plus call center and really dial in on what your call center is doing and fine tune as best as you can and then use digital to drive to that. So. Okay, great. How are you, how are companies handling cancellations? Well, you know, I think probably the first thing is, is that if you don't have a cancel process, <laughs> there's no better time to get one than to now. And than now, uh, I mean, for us, we've always had a cancel process, and so we're not making a ton of changes there. Um, what I would say, uh, let's go to the next slide here real quick, um, is prepare your scripts now. Um, you know, right now, our cancel rate has been on par with what has typically been in the past. We've not seen a lot of folks canceling as of yet. And I say as of yet because um, we're, I don't know if people are structured like us, but at Triangle, we do monthly billing. And so, um, and we typically take a pretty good amount of cancels on the first of the month, right? And so we we bill out all the cards on the first. And then when um, when people see that on the charge and they state, they're like, oh yeah, I got pest control. And so right now our cancels are doing pretty well. We've got scripts uh, prepared for that, but I don't know, I don't think we're going to know what the effect on our industry is going to be until we go past April 1st and we charge those cards. I think that'll be a good time to really see if we're truly as resilient as we think we are. Um, and so if you go to, you know, if I were you, I would be looking at my scripts and the next thing I'd be doing is credits, 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 credits. Think about um, how you can leverage credits to keep people in service. If that means giving them credit towards a service, giving them credit towards a lower monthly payment for three to six months, if that helps, offer a prepaid discount if you've not done that. The main thing is, is just really, really listen in on the calls and train your call center folks to listen in and, and enable them to, to solve the problem real time. And so if it were me, you know, I think one of the best ways to, um, you know, one of the best ways to, to ebb this is to really um, think through what your cancel script's gonna be. And I mean, I can tell you for Triangle, our cancel rate was 0.74% in March. It was just a wonderful thing. And so um, again, I don't want to do a victory lap here yet because we don't know, but you know, so far um, we're faring pretty well there. Okay, great. So to summarize sales quickly, what are your top sales tips for companies to be employing right now during the crisis? Yeah, I would say right now that just to make it quick is that, you know, embrace the inbound model, get good with digital and get, get your call center tuned up if you don't have it. Uh, the second thing is to manage your call center and, and, you know, don't have fear about putting people in their homes because I can tell you, at least from us, it's working quite well. And I think if you get the right procedures in place, I think if you get the right technology in place, it can be a very positive thing for your company. And then the last thing is, is just know what your cancel process is gonna be and make sure you get that figured out now, especially before April 1st, if you bill out on the first of the month. Mm -hmm. so. Okay, great. Well, moving on to people, um, which we all know, uh, your people, Management. Oh, Dan, were you going to talk about door to door? I'm sorry, I got off script there. <laughs> Little off script. Well, I, I don't have a whole lot to say other than we work with some of the the, the best best um, uh, you know uh, door to door companies, some of the biggest in the industry. And um, one of the things that they do is that they tend to grow very quickly, and it takes a lot of cash to grow. And we always talk about, well, if we dial back the door to door, how profitable we'd be. Well, their gross margins are extremely high because their route density is extremely high and there's a whole bunch of reasons. And it may be a, a, a good idea this year. This might be the year that you take a break. Uh, I'm not saying that you get away from it totally, but at the end of the day, um, you know, you know, what happens when this this ends? Do people just go back to the way they were or are they freaked out? Are they still washing their hands? Are they are they answering the door? Are they, you know, all that kind of thing. And so 
by dialing it back and taking a profit, nobody ever uh, went out of business by taking profits. So that might be a way to do it because the best, uh, you know, the best best offense is a good defense, right? And so you may want to do that. Uh, the other thing that I always hear year to year is that these door knockers get more and more expensive. They, uh, um, you know, they demand, uh, they, they command a bigger salary. And so um, maybe if the demand for them drops, then maybe in the future, um, you know, your your door to door folks will, uh, um, you know, uh, uh, determine that, that that maybe working for a little bit less money is is better than not working at all. So that's the advice that I would have for door to door folks. But door to door companies are in an absolute um, outstanding position to profit uh, if they dial back the the, the, the the summer sales crew. So. OK, great. Um, okay, so now we'll move on to people, which we all know can make or break your business. Um, Donnie, in terms of personnel, what are you guys doing right now? Well, again, I'm full of disclaimers today. I'm sorry. Okay. Uh, so I'm just going to say for people here, we're going to have to blow through this section. There's a ton here, and I'm going to just kind of give what I think is the most important information now. And in, in later webinars, we're going to get into a lot more detail. But I think right now, one of the most important things you could be focused on is protecting your production capability. That would be both in the office and out in the field, because when you think about it, all it takes is one person. If you have an office where folks are coming into one person getting the virus and then infecting everyone else, you know, now you go from say maybe 70% productivity down to 0%. And same thing for technicians, right? If, if the word gets out that one of your technicians was uh, infected with the virus and you're going inside of people's homes. And so if, uh, if I were to give one, piece of advice on people management right now is get very, very serious about protecting your people. Um, and I hate to say it, you know, protecting your uh, production capability, but we're a service company. That's what we provide. And so, and, you know, just keeping in mind that all it takes is just one. So. Okay. How are you seeing, um, well, how are you handling field personnel? Well, I know in, um, you know, for field personnel, I've already talked about the office, right? Most office we've got, uh, you know, we got folks doing a virtual office at this point. Um, I, I just want to, before I get to field, there's one thing I do want to say about um, office personnel. If you cannot get folks out into their own homes, if you can't leave them there, if your phone system doesn't support it, um, I would be implementing some sort of social distancing policy, um, you know, trying to keep your office as much as you can. Um, where they're not around each other. And then, you know, I, I talk about this whole idea of a sanitation captain and making it someone's job that every hour they go around and hit doorknobs, handles, those types of things. If you can't do that, obviously the most ideal is to leave your office staff at home and have them work from home if you can do that. Going over to the field side, um, outside services only, I think that's pretty clear. I think most folks are doing that. Another thing I would be doing is screening my customers. Um, you know, if, if someone is saying it absolutely is necessary for me to go inside, there's like a callback, a new start where I know I've got to go in for a bed bug job or some sort of thing like that. I would be screening. Uh, we've got an example on the resources page of questions that you can ask. Um, you know, have your tech starting from home. Certainly don't have them congregating near your office. Just have them start from home. What we do is we have them text in their chemical order. Uh, a manager will put that outside the outside the office. They come by and pick it up. It's like a drive through thing, uh, just like they're doing restaurants right now. And the main thing is, is that you protect your field folks with everything that you got you know look at your ppe and and realize that you know i would be scavenging that as much as possible because right now even the government can't get enough ppe and so i would be very very uh, particular about what gets used and i would have folks scavenging that as much as they can um, and i think the last thing on this is that you know follow your routine follow your routine both out in the field and in the office you know if you've got checklists and those types of things um, you know, this is just going back to the whole leadership thing. This is just adapting. If you've got checklists already, you keep following it. You know, we don't do training right now at Triangle, you know, both in the office and, um, and in the field, unless it has something specifically to do with this virus, you know, kind of the long-term training we've kind of shut out for right now, but we still do our weekly meetings. We still do our check-in one-on-ones. We still make sure our checklist gets done. And you know, another thing that that does is it communicates that you're actually watching and that you can operate in this new environment. So I think for now, I think that's probably enough on people. Again, we got, we, there's way more we can go into as far as payroll credits and those types of things, but I think Dan's gonna talk a little bit about that a little bit later on. So for now, I think that's pretty good. 
Okay, great. So uh, what I would say, just I just wanted to add on, on the people side is get remote. We've been doing it for years, our, our firm. Uh, on any given day, 40% of the people are working from home. Make sure that you have collaboration tools. Um, make sure that you have check-ins and we use checklists. Checklists are key. So that's, that's uh, from a people perspective, that's where I'd be. So if you wanna move on to finance, and this is, uh, you know, this is uh, kind of, um, again, uh, a good offense uh, is a great defense, okay? So this is a slide, this is an interesting slide. Um, I did a talk for PCT Magazine um, in 2009, I think it was February of 2009. And if you can see, I'm not sure whether you can see the cover of PCT Magazine, but um, it was talking about how the economy was uh, collapsing and the major events that happened. The stock market was collapsing. The housing crisis was, you know, in full swing. Uh, uh, at that point, there were record price uh, prices at the pump. The auto industry imploded. The meltdown of financial services. Manufacturing was leaving the U.S. and we were in two wars. Okay, so it doesn't get much worse than that. Okay, and I asked the, the the folks at the meeting is, hey, can we survive this? You know, uh, and the strong companies will because time is going to pass no matter what happens. Is it going to be tough? Yeah. Is it going to take a long time? Possibly. Is time going to pass no matter what we did? And and the answer is yeah. And I actually pulled this slide out. I did a a talk at the PCT 100 last year, and uh, um, kind of talked about uh, you know uh, three weeks ago we were in a much different spot than we were now. The economy was really you know humming and whatnot. And and the question is, was I psychic? Did I make this bold prediction? Um, you know, I'd like to think so, but but. At the end of the day, we go through cycles and this too shall pass, okay? And so, but just remember that cash is king because we don't know how long this is going on. Some of the stuff that Donnie was talking about in terms of marketing, uh, we're seeing the same things, not a whole lot of, uh, um, you know, uh, we're not seeing a lot of people cancel. We're not seeing a lot of uh, um, differences in, in that we did last year. But if this goes for another month or two months or three months where it starts getting really real, where people are losing their jobs, it could get a little bit ugly. And just remember that cash is king. And really, so then you say, okay, well, what next? And really it's, if you can go back to that last, uh, go back, uh, back to the two prong. Oops, sorry. Yeah. So yeah, so recovery is two pronged. Okay, this is a little bit different than every other recession, or if you want to call it a recession, because nobody is, uh, we're, we're we're pretty sure we're in a recession, but nobody said it. But really, it's when the stay-at-home orders stop, right? Once we can go out of our houses, then what happens? What does the the environment look like? Is it over? Or most likely, we're going to be in a recession. We will be in a recession when this thing ends. Next slide. So how do you see companies responding then from a financial perspective? So, uh, yeah, so uh, people, right now people are doing a lot of research and um, understanding what their um, options are. And I'll talk about some of that on the next few slides, but nobody's really making rash moves, but everybody's checking it out. Everybody's calling me up, hey, do I qualify for this SBA money? What about all of these tax credits and these payroll credits and things? How does it all work? Um, but it all depends on how long this crisis lasts. Okay. If, if uh, you know, if it lasts another few weeks, I think we, we get out of it and we have a V recovery really quickly. If it goes on for a long time, it could get very ugly. So clients are looking to understand their finances better and how quickly they can cut expenses if needed. OK, um, it's a great opportunity to do some planning. It's an opportunity to shed some weak players and look for stronger folks when this is over. Um, you don't want to say that, but at the end of the day, if you have some weak players on your team, this would be a good time to, to you know, um, obviously lay them off for lack of work and um, maybe look for a replacement. The, the, you know, when, when the economy is really in the doldrums, it's tough on business. When the economy is humming like it was three weeks ago or four weeks ago, it's also difficult for us. Everybody wants to buy our product and service, but we can't find anybody to work for us because everybody who we want to employ is currently. Hey, hey Dan, I just want to make a yeah, quick point. Yeah, you know, sure. what's interesting is um, my entire leadership team came on board during the housing crisis, you know, 
I mean, right. I got some really good folks because of that. So I, I, it's a really good point. I agree with that 100%. Yeah. So, so this, so when the economy is 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 really on fire, it's not the best time for us. When it's really in the doldrums, it's not the best time. When it's just in the middle, it is because people are buying and there are uh, employees available. So um, just think of that as kind of uh, some of the silver line. Next slide. What steps do you recommend companies take then, at a minimum, as far as budgets go and cash management? So the first thing that, that you want to do is make sure that you redo your budget, okay? And what I would do is three scenarios, worst case, medium case, and best case, okay? Because you've got to understand that our business, one of the reasons that we're going to survive is we're not General Motors, right? When people stop buying cars, we don't have a factory to operate and uh, all the machines to, to, to take care of. Everything in our business is a variable cost with a few exceptions, some of your, uh, you know, the vehicles and, and whatnot, but everything is a variable cost. And I'm not in any way suggesting that you start, you know, uh, taking draconian measures, but if you had to, you could, right? You could cut the labor, which will cut the chemical, which will cut, um, you know, the fuel in the trucks, which will cut the insurance. Your insurance is based on gross receipts, right? So it's, we're, we're, you know, very highly um, um, dependent on variable costs, and we can cut these if we have to. Almost anything can be changed on the fly, with the exceptions of vehicles that maybe you already took delivery this year. But remember, cash is king, plan according, accordingly. Right now, things are looking pretty good for our industry. You know, we, we, we're, we're essential services, we're noted as essential services. And, um, you know, uh, the, the marketing seems to still be working because people are at home and they're bored and they're on the internet and they're, uh, uh, and, and they're buying stuff, right? That's, that's what we're seeing. I know that uh, my family, we're getting more Amazon boxes than, uh, than, than, than normal. Um, oh, next gosh. slide. Okay. Tell us what the, what's the latest with taxes. Okay. So this is a fairly fluid situation. I mean, the, 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 I just got a, a, a notice uh, probably about five minutes ago that the House passed uh, the legislation. Yesterday, the uh, Senate passed it, and it's going to go to the president. So it looks like um, we've got um, uh, the new laws in effect. So basically, um, and, and there was a new law passed last week that, that handled some of this, like the, the first couple of points. So uh, what's happening? Well, if you're Tax return is due on April 15th. You get an extension till uh, July 15th. You also get an extension to uh, pay until July 15th. That's huge. Uh, anybody can get a, an extension in the past, but you can't get an extension to pay. Here, we're going to get extensions to pay. Okay. There's also some federal rebates uh, for for people in certain um, uh, uh, categories. If you're earning, if you're single and earning less than seventy-five thousand dollars, the government is going to send you within the next two weeks a check in the amount of twelve hundred dollars. Okay. If you're married, it goes up to one hundred and fifty thousand. You'll get twenty-four hundred dollars. And if you're over those amounts, that amount gets phased out until um, uh, I believe it's ninety-nine thousand dollars, where you would not get any more. Um, how about pension distributions? I can't tell you. How many times normally people say, ah, I've got this 401k and I've got this, 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 this IRA, but I can't get the money out because I'm going to get a 10% penalty plus I'm going to pay the taxes on it. And so usually, you know, if you want to take $100 out, you're going to end up paying more than $50 in taxes. Well, there's a, um, uh, there, there's a little reprieve in this law that allows you, as long as it's for, you know, the virus and, 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 you know, how you paper that is, is up to you, but you can make pension distributions. You won't be subject to the 10% penalty and you can take the income that you would normally take in the current year. You can spread that over a couple of years afterwards. Okay. So that's a, a big deal. Okay. And Dan, just to, just to clarify yeah. that, you don't have to be a business owner. That's for anyone, right? They can pull that's for you. anybody. Yeah. And that's right, a right. great idea, right? Because yeah. now it's like, you want I mean, people want to do big projects or whatever. I mean, I just think it's going to, with no penalty, that's it. You got to, you got to, um, it's got to be related to the virus. So if, if you're looking to do, uh, you know, put an addition on your house, uh, you know, how do you make the case? Maybe you need social distancing, so I need to double the size of my house or whatever. But, uh, I was at home uh, on lockdown for a month. What more do you need? <laughs> that's right. 
<laughs> I'm totally affected. So <laughs> that's right. There, there's another one that that's really interesting is the deferment of payment of employer portion of employment taxes and self-employment taxes. So that means that some of your 941 taxes you can actually not pay them this year, but you're going to pay 50% of them in 2021 and 50% of them in 2022. If you're going to use this. Just make sure that you're good at budgeting money because there definitely will be a day of reckoning when you have to pay all these payroll taxes. And oh, by the way, payroll taxes, the government is not very forgiving when you don't pay your payroll taxes because it, you're, you're, you're basically withholding money from employees and whatnot, and, and, and so you're a fiduciary. Okay. And then there's a number of other uh, provisions. So the carry back of net operating losses, if you're a C corporation or an individual, it's actually two years, but they've pushed that to five years. Why is that important? Because that allows you to carry back. So if, if you've got some net operating losses um, or, or if you've got income in, in the, um, um, you know, for the past several years, and you've got a net operating loss this year, which a lot of people will, you can actually carry it back in and get an, an immediate refund of tax. So there's some, uh, uh, you know, there's some relief there. Next slide, please. Okay. Okay, talk about who pays for paid sick leave. Yeah, so this is a big one that came through is, is that um, the government is basically saying that everybody, uh, or all companies must pay sick leave for at least two weeks if your employee contracts the virus or if they're at home taking care of somebody with the virus or somebody at home uh, is in quarantine okay and then you say well i'm a small business how do i do that well what it the, the government will actually pay for it and how do you pay for it you pay for it through your 941 taxes so you'll call your payroll company and uh, i actually have a, um, a webinar that i'm sitting in on monday to show the mechanics uh, with adp but basically what's going to happen is that money that that is withheld that that you give to the government three days after your payroll um, you're going to get to take a credit on that somebody asked me oh well i gotta wait till the end of the year i need the cash now well you'll get the cash now now if that amount exceeds the payroll taxes then you can apply for a quick refund and they'll give you your money back within two weeks okay that's what they say okay next slide please okay how about layoffs what if you need to lay off a team member right now for lack of work so again we talked about that before uh, if you have some weaker players you might want to lay them off but if this thing goes on for a while you may have to lay some folks off okay so they'll be a bit, uh, um, they will be eligible for uh, unemployment insurance the new law extends uh, most benefits from 26 weeks to 39 weeks but also the feds will put an extra six hundred dollars a week on top of that that doesn't mean that they're getting all that money if if, if they're not if, they, they can get up to that amount of money, okay, if, if that's what they earned. If they were earning far less, then you're basically your unemployment benefits and whatever bonus would get them to, um, so that they're not hurt, so that they, they would be where they were, okay? Okay, how about the SBA? What's, what's available? Yeah, so this is the biggest, um, the, the, the biggest um, uh, thing that people are asking questions about. And what I want to say is that if you remember Hurricane Katrina and all the fraud and all of the crazy government hoops that you had to jump through and all of the upsetness that the that, that, that people experienced, this is Katrina on steroids. This is a hundred times worse. And if you think that you're going to get a check in the mail and you're going to get a call back from your uh, friendly local banker or SBA person saying, hey, you, you, you did everything. I'm giving you your money now. I hope it happens. I'm just not that much of an optimist now. So there's a couple of different programs that, that are available. The first one is called the Small po uh, Employers uh, Program. And basically, if you're willing to maintain your payroll through this, through eight weeks of this, okay you can borrow money so if you borrow money from the government and it funds payroll costs and you don't lay anyone off that uh, pays interest on your mortgage pays rent utilities other operating costs you may and i use the word you may have that loan forgiven okay there's a bunch of um, um one, one of the problems with uh coming up with legislation like this 
that legislation is a thousand pages that nobody's read. In addition, a lot of times the mechanics of these things, they put out to the regulators and say, okay, well, you draft regulations on how all this is going to work. Okay. But essentially what they're saying is that if you keep people employed um, uh, and you borrow this money under this program, that you may have that um, debt forgiven. Okay. Next slide. Okay. Now, there's another program, and this is the same program that is available if a tornado came or a hurricane or another natural disaster. Hey, you Dan, can, I don't, um, can you go back one slide? Because this is, this is crazy, right? I shouldn't say it's crazy. It's awesome. So just to be clear here, you have to show, okay, so so long as you keep people on the payroll, and then you have to show so, someone that you had damage as a result of the virus, or is it just like you kept people on the payroll? Yeah, and so if you, if you get a, approved for an SBA loan and it's under the small employer uh, program, then um, you've got to show that you didn't lay them off, right? So you've got to, a, you, you've got to qualify for all this stuff. We'll talk about that the next slide. But if okay. you don't lay anybody off and um, you use the money that you got for basically for working capital purposes to, to, to run your business. Um, even if you have somebody in your organization that maybe you could have laid them off, but uh, you know, you want to keep them around because it's the right thing to do during this. Um, you, you can get relief here. That's Excellent. great. Yeah. Yeah. Next slide. Uh, so, so anyway, the, the, the next, uh, the, 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 um, the, the, the big money is in these loans, these disaster loans that you can get. And this is no different. They, they, you know, you're just eligible for it. This is not a new thing. But um, what you've got to do is you've got to show damage. You've got to show economic damage, which means that, um, you know, it, or your revenues down. What is it that you lost? Can you quantify that damage? And if you can, you can borrow up to $2 million. Um, these loans can be used to pay fixed debts, payroll, accounts payable, and other bills. Um, I can't tell you how many calls that I've had that people have said, well, that's awesome, so I'll buy a building with it, and I'll do all these kinds of things. And Marketing. And we do marketing with it. Put all the money into marketing. <laughs> the, the answer is um, it's, it's probably you're, you're, you're uh, probably going to be in violation of the covenant, and um, it, it will get called. And, and so, know, hang on. You're, so you're filling out the you... application, so you don't want to get involved with bank fraud. But go ahead. So let's define damage, right? So I have this goal to grow. Like I'm just trying to think, okay, if I'm a door-to-door -door company and I'd planned on putting on 2,000 accounts and I was going to grow, I don't know, 70%. And now I can't do that. Now, I may not take a loss, but I don't necessarily go where I, was, where I would typically go had this not happened. So is that do I consider myself damaged even though I didn't necessarily take a loss or is it like so I've got to be that, that's an interesting one and 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 one that that uh, case by case but because you know why stop there well I did a hundred thousand dollars in my business this year but I had planned to do 40 million dollars so yeah we're, we're gonna, gonna do by 39 triangle I, I, so I mean yeah. we've been really damaged <laughs> so I see where you're going with that but yeah. I'm gonna <laughs> guess that there are some rules against that and again this is more of the where the regulators have to come up with um, you know uh, regulations on so how it's all in definition is. really I mean to try to figure this out is understanding what definitions are right so if you know, if you normally use your credit line uh, to to pay your payroll, hey, you know, maybe you can use this to pay your payroll or or working capital. The nice thing is that the, that the interest rate is three three point seven five percent, and look at the terms. You can go out to thirty years. Okay, but what you, what you're going to do is you're going to get on the the website. It's sba.gov, and the first front pages and, and and I've already been through the process to 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 see what uh, what I could do. I can tell you that the website is crashing. It's <laughs> timing out. It took me a whole day just to get through it, uh, to get through one loan. Okay. We had this idea that we would uh, uh, offer a service to our clients to go through this and we've decided not to. We're going to let our clients get on the website. We'll support you and get you all the information that you need. But sitting there at the computer uh, all day is probably not a good use of our time when we charge by the hour. Okay, so um, next slide, please. So 
uh, what's going to be uh, uh, the determining factor whether you can get these loans? Credit histories. You have to have acceptable credit. That doesn't mean you have to have stellar credit, but you've got to have acceptable credit. Um, you must have the ability to repay the loan, right? They're not gonna give you money for you to go bankrupt next week, although that may happen. But in in uh, demonstrating uh, or, or putting your uh, application through, um, you may, um, you know, uh, you're, you're gonna show how you're gonna get through it. And a lot of times uh, in the past, um, you needed collateral, anything over 25,000, so real estate or whatever. I'm not sure with this, um, catastrophe, how how um, stringent they're going to be. Uh, it said, th this, this is right from the website, SBA will not decline a loan because of lack of collateral, but the SBA will require the bar borrower to pledge collateral that is available. So you may have to put up some collateral. By the way, remember what the SBA does. The SBA doesn't lend you the money. A local bank lends you the money and the SBA guarantees it. Okay, so you're going to be working with a local banker. Okay. Next slide, please. Okay, so what are some of the things that you're going to need when you get to the website? And for clients of PCO bookkeepers, give us a call. We'll get all that information for you. You're going to need the last three years of your entity's tax returns. So if you're C Corp, uh, LLC, et cetera, you're going to need last three years of it. And they're going to ask you if you own 50% or more of any other entity. So a lot of our clients own real estate in a separate LLC, or maybe they're involved in a different business. And if you're more than 50% owner of that, you've got to bring uh, uh, those uh, tax returns out as well, because you're going to be entering this information on the website. Okay. You're also going to need personal financial statements. Um, it actually creates the personal financial statements on the website. It asks you about your assets. It asks you about your liabilities. Um, the one thing that um, um, if you've got 35 vehicles and 35 separate loans on those vehicles, you're going to need to have the, the, um, the details of each of those loans. And what I mean by that is who's the bank? What was the original date that you took the loan? What's the monthly payment? What's the interest rate and what's your current balance? And so uh, if you're a PCO bookkeeper client and we have the information, let us know. We'll get it for you. But you're going to enter each loan itself on the website. OK. Uh, and then you're also going to have to give the, the SBA uh, authorization to uh, they're, they're, it's called a transcript of authorization. They're going to get to go to the IRS to see whether you're telling the truth and your tax returns line up with what you're saying. Uh, I highly recommend that you don't lie. Okay, <laughs> next slide. <laughs> okay. All right, bonus so content, tell us bonus content, you... morality. Sorry. Right, right, morality. <laughs> Go ahead. Dan, tell us how you expect the crisis to affect mergers and acquisitions. So as you know, uh, we've been pretty heavily involved with mergers and acquisitions. Did over $150 million worth of, uh, uh, of, uh, uh, of uh, mergers and acquisitions in the past 13, 14 months. Um, for now, it's shut down with many of the strategic buyers. Okay, I think this creates a tremendous opportunity for private equity firms or domestic companies. Uh, and let me give you my take on it. Um, if you look at Renekill's um, website, they did a press release uh, the day before yesterday that they're shutting down all an M&A and that they're asking their uh, no bonuses for their senior managers and they are um, saving money every which way they can. We've also had a deal pulled from Antisemex. It was ready to close on Friday. They pulled it, uh, said that, um, you know, in the current environment, uh, we're just not comfortable uh, doing this deal. We will do it when all of this madness ends. But the fact of the matter is, I spoke to um, uh, a good friend of mine at Renekill, and one of the reasons that they did this is, remember, Renekill is a worldwide company. Antisemex is a worldwide company, okay? Orkin and Service Master also have operations, but those two specifically have huge operations in Italy and Spain and some of the areas that are really being affected by this, right? Um, Renekill, from what I understand, is down like 40 or 45 percent in Italy. People just aren't allowed to do anything in Spain as well. So they're a worldwide company. And once you get those two 
players to take a hiatus from this M&A market, if you're a private equity firm or you're a company looking to make purchases somewhere in North America, you're going to have the pick of the lot, right? You're not going to be up against them. So I actually think that this could be a good thing if you have the nerve. And you've got to have a lot of nerve, right, to buy a pest control company right now, because I'm going to buy a pest control company that I think is doing a million dollars, right? And you're going to uh, represent to me that you did a million dollars last year. Well, if this thing goes on for six months, what does that do to your pest control company that you think is a million dollars? Maybe it's significantly less, okay? So, um, you know, the, the other thing is, though, that once you know, if you look at the stock market, the stock market's revalued. Assets have revalued. I'm thinking that the big high flying deals that you saw, the three multiples, three times revenue, I think that they're going to go away. I think that multiples are going to pull into more realistic multiples. But I think that companies that weren't getting those three multiples, that were getting reasonable amounts, I don't think that they're going to pull back at all. That's mainly your smaller companies, um, maybe some companies that uh, you're, you're um, you know, maybe uh, some companies that are not as stellar as some of the, the top companies, those are still, the, the, the values aren't going to move back as quickly. So I think that we, we could be in good shape uh, uh, there. Um, and, you know, but until the stay-at-home orders are lifted, um, uh, I don't really see any meaningful offers being made to purchasers. Everybody's scared. Luckily, we've got a couple of deals in uh, with uh, one of the private equity group based uh, uh, purchasers who have told us that they're going to honor uh, all of the, um, uh, the LOIs that they put out there. So um, we're looking forward to that. But uh, I think we'll be back in business if this thing ends, you know, in May or June. I think we'll be back in business by the fall, uh, the mergers and acquisitions. It just, I don't think that it's gonna be as hot. You know, I, 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 I don't believe that this thing's just gonna end and we're gonna go back to where we were. I think that there's been significant economic damage done and some more on the way. And I think it's gonna take a little time to get back. But if you remember how I started off this discussion with that slide from 2009, are we gonna get through it? Yeah. Is it gonna be hard? Yeah. Um, Pest control and lawn care seem to be terrific recession-resistant businesses um, that, um, you know, they, they, they have a tremendous resiliency. And so I think that, uh, you know, that, that, that merger and acquisition, while it's going to be slowed, it's not going to be over. You know, Dan, one of the things I was thinking about is, I think you're dead on, because the reality is, is what they're buying is a recurring revenue stream. And so they're concerned that, you know, we don't know what's going to happen with cancellations quite yet. And I think until there's some certainty around that, I think the rates are going to be down. And I also think that you would expect to see a lot more, I, I should say, a lot more margin there to cover potential cancellations just because we don't really know the long-term effect. Yeah. So the bigger deals, we never really had attrition clauses in. So when we had bigger deals that went go off with a strategic buyer, you know, one of the Renekills, uh, Terminex and whatnot, there's no um, uh, retention clause. They would just buy them, right? The smaller deals, there are retention clauses. But right now, why would you buy a, a company that's doing $10 million and pay $30 million, not knowing what that company's going to do in the next 12 months? And so right. until there's yeah. clarity, I think right. that we're, we're on ice. Yep, I agree with that. Yep. Okay, well, let's get to some questions. Um, okay, we're gonna start out with Donnie. How, okay. um, how do I make sure that I maintain market share during the pandemic? And is it reasonable to think I can still grow this year? So I'm probably the, the biggest optimist there is. I think you can do more than just maintain. I think you can take even more market share. Um, and, you know, depending on timing, as far as how long this goes, I think you absolutely can grow. Right now, the marketing numbers are showing um, that everything's on par, and I think there's a lot of opportunity there. So I think, you know, if I were looking to grow market share, I want to grow the business, is if you don't have this strategy, just meet people where they are, right? And where they are right now is at home. So I'd be heavy on branding. I'd be heavy on inbound. Um, and, and I would get this out of my brain that we can't grow during this because it's happening. Now, that could change if this goes on for two months. But right now, companies are growing, uh, at least on the digital side. And so um, 
I think just maintain the course if that's what you're doing. And if it's not what you're doing, then I'd be changing course. So I think that's I think that's how you get more market share and grow your business right now. Okay, great. Dan, what what are some strategies for maintaining cash flow in turbulent times? What what top few financial things should a business do in the current business climate? <laughs> So obviously you want to be prudent with your cash, but if you're putting uh, money into marketing and it's working, keep doing it because um, you know, you're building your business. Um, but if things really hit the skids, again, we're in a variable cost business. You can cut whatever you need to, to cut. There are consequences to making tough decisions, right? And what I mean by that is when you start laying off people, people remember that right? When you keep them around, even though you might not need them, but they're good people, they'll remember that as well, okay? So it's really important, but just remember, if everything hits the skids, then, you know, you can basically dial things back, and there will be a tomorrow. Not so much with a manufacturing company, or maybe a distribution facility where, you know, there's tons of money, um, you know, uh, invested in, in in product and whatnot. The other things that you could do is are, are manage your AR. Make sure you know manage your credit policies. If you do quarterly pest control, and they still owe the money, do you want to go and do that next quarter? And if you do, you definitely don't want to do the third one. Manage your AR because your AR is going to fall apart. Now. Most of our clients do first of the month credit card billing, so they don't have an AR issue. But take a look, see what you know. What happens? Donnie said something interesting on April first. I'm a little worried about April first too, uh, when you <laughs> charge all those credit cards and people start to realize that they have to pay you. Right now, are they going to quit? Well, what happens on June first if we're all still sitting in our houses? Then what happens? So make sure that you manage your AR. Uh, next thing is. Uh, a lot of people who are in really good shape pay their vendors right away. They just do it, you know, and I always say to them, why would you do that, right? Oh, well, because we got the money. Well, stretch out your vendor terms. Make sure, except for your accountant, make sure that you, uh, <laughs> make sure. And your marketing company. And your marketing company. <laughs> make sure that you uh, are, you know, if, if you've got 30-day terms or 60-day terms, use them, okay? Um, next one is, um, if possible, make sure that you have credit lines. This particular uh, uh, economic downturn is, is different than the last one. The last one was caused by the banks. And I just remember that the banks were canceling people's credit lines without even telling them. It happened to me. I went to draw money on my credit line and it was closed. I don't think that that's going to happen here, especially with the amount of stimulus that the government is is pumping into the economy. I think that the banking system is sound and will be sound, but see if you can get credit lines. I don't know that I would tell you to draw those credit lines, but what I can tell you is about a week and a half ago, one of the big strains on the whole financial system was that companies like Boeing and airline companies and, and whatnot were drawing down all of their credit lines to have the money in the bank so that um, you know uh, it, they, they wouldn't get canceled on them. So make sure that you have some credit lines. Um, if you're eligible, take care. Take take advantage of the government bailouts. Um, you know, it's 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 your, uh, um, you know, it's 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 your money. It's uh, it's your government. You pay taxes. See what you can do on that. And last of all, redo that budget. Make sure that you redo your budget. Make sure that you do a worst case scenario, a medium case scenario, and a best case scenario, so that you know when to fold them. You know, as uh, Kenny Rogers said. Can you yeah. sing that? Can you sing that no, part of the I'm not, a, I'm not no. a good singer. I, I, I uh, probably can. No one to hum. Yeah. <laughs> you've got the guitar. Are you going to? Yeah, yeah there's a guitar. guitar. I, didn't, I didn't put it in the air. I'm sorry. I know. All right. Yeah. Okay. Anyway. Well, we're, we've gone about um, an hour and 15 minutes. So let's do one more question. Donnie, um, how do I minimize cancellations? And should I be sending out an email to all of my customers addressing the virus, or will that do harm? Oh, this is by far a very controversial question. I, I sent a couple emails out um, prior to this webinar and, and I caught some flack from people saying, you know, how could you not tell your customers what you're doing? That's awful advice. And let me explain that a little bit. Okay, so let me just get this out here now. I don't think you should send emails to customers about the virus. Anytime we send an email, by far, we're gonna take anywhere from five to 10 cancels, right? 
it's just what it is. We remind people that, hey, we're there. And like, oh yeah, I'm moving or whatever. And so essentially we initiate a cancel. Now, most of the time when we send an email, there's also an offer. So we get a lot of upsells as a result of it. And that's just kind of part of doing business, right? Why would I send an email out without an offer that I'm going to instill more fear I'm going to instill more uncertainty and give people a reason to cancel me. So I am not a fan of emailing. I mean, if you want to be the hero and tell folks all the stuff that you're doing, wonderful. Tell your technician to tell the folks if they see them. I would not be, um, I would not be intentionally instilling fear and uncertainty in my customers because all you're doing is you're asking them, can you please cancel my service? So, um, I would say to minimize cancellations is keep doing what you're doing. Uh, I'm not going to say out of sight, out of mind. What I, you know, when the tech is there, have them, you know, they're doing outside service. Look for little things that you can do. Uh, you know, bring the trash cans in. The typical things that you would normally do: call, text the customers, tell them what you're seeing, what you're doing. Uh, that will certainly minimize cancellations. And remember, your local business. Most folks right now, they're very pro local business, and so I'd stay on that as much as I could. But I certainly would not be, you know, emailing them, hey, we're doing this and we're doing that. I mean, it just I would stay away from that completely. So okay. I couldn't, couldn't agree more on that. Yeah. Okay, great. Well, we're gonna wrap up today's session uh, with all that great information and just wanna remind everyone to please reach out to Cole March or to PCO bookkeepers if you need anything at this time. They won't be emailing you to to, to ask it or to to remind you about the virus. Um, our next episode is going to be next Friday, featuring HR expert Gene Seawright. Oh, hang on. So this so is, yeah, this is a treat. This, this yeah, is a real I'm treat. Please. So, so for those of you who know Jean, she's uh, a, an absolute icon. She, she knows HR uh, state to state. Um, many of our clients use her. Um, and so um, she's going to be with us uh, next Friday, and uh, we're looking forward to uh, having her talk about uh, her perspective on, on um, you know, HR, uh, on the new laws and how it affects you and whatnot. Yeah, I think, you know, just to expand on, I mean, the good thing is, is like, you know, there's so many laws that have changed with, with this virus and what's come out. I think just having her here just saying this is what you can and what you cannot do because there's a lot of exceptions as you can imagine and I've never came out of a Gene Seawright presentation without my mind being blown so we're super excited about having her on board next week. I think it's going to be a great great session. Well thank you both and we look forward to seeing all the attendees back on that session next week. Same, same Thanks part. so much. Thank See you. Guys. Take care. Thank you. Nice job. Are we off live? <laughs> I think so. we are. Are we? I think so. We have to All right.